What is the thing that's talked about most to do with autism? Is it our amazing <laughs> mathematical abilities that seem to just happen to all autistic people? They just become math geniuses. Or is it our lack of empathy that just seems to <laughs> seems to catch your attention? Obviously, these things not not <laughs> like not applied to autism in in any way, apart from maybe a select group of individuals. What I'm talking about is meltdowns. Meltdowns and autism seem to be just like the t the two most <laughs> search terms for people outside of the autistic community and for a good reason well not for a good reason it's probably for a bad reason it's to gawk at them it's to watch them having a meltdown and thinking oh my god this is such a crazy situation how is this kid like this what are the parents like and you know all of these things sort of pop up in people's minds but when we come to actually talk about autistic adults People who've grown up, you know, autistic children, they grow into autistic adults. And meltdowns, it's it's kind of a, a, a tricky situation because the, a lot of people, they don't have meltdowns. They have what's called an autistic shutdown. Um, but there is a significant, significant amount of people who have adult meltdowns. I am an adult meltdowner. I have meltdowns. It might be quite hard for some people to comprehend but I do get myself into almost fit-like states of anxiety, overload, anything like that, and not being able to talk and all that stuff. I have meltdowns, and it's just something that, that has occurred or, or continues to occur, mostly due to my mental health. I have quite severe anxiety and depression, and a lot of the time that has a large impact on my both my ability to function, um, but also sort of my, my sensitivity to anxiety and to meltdowns and things of that nature. What I want to talk to you about today is kind of some insider insider knowledge on meltdowns. You know, you, you may see what it looks like from those videos. And you may know that, you know, not everyone has a meltdown the same way. But you don't really understand exactly, I guess, how it is for an autistic person to have a meltdown or maybe you're autistic yourself and you know perhaps there's some things in this video that may you know once i say it it may ring true for you although i haven't really done a channel introduction my name is thomas henley <laughs> if you don't know if you don't know by the by the name next to my video and all that jazz but i'll, I'll let you off now lay off <laughs> so yes i'm going to be talking about adult meltdowns specifically my meltdowns um, and a lot of these things are some, some things that a lot of autistic people um, in my comments on Instagram who have who've really related to them. Uh, some things not so much, but I'm going to tell you about my experience with them. Some of the insider information that people don't know just looking in on the outside. Number one, temporary control. Meltdowns are incredibly scary disorientating, painful, anxiety provoking, all of those stuff, a mentally exhausting experience. It's not a fun experience by any means necessary. And, you know, in, in public, I can actually prolong a meltdown. I can, I can prevent a meltdown um, for an amount of time. And this may seem a bit of a weird concept, but you know, com combining states of dissociation and shutdowns and also the the potential consequences of, of sort of having a meltdown in public, around friends, around dates, around, you know, any any kind of situation. It's a very daunting thing. And whenever I find myself in situations like that, the usual thing that I do is I go into shutdown or I dramatically reduce the amount of social communication that I'm doing and try and concentrate on my phone and take breaks and things like that. Um, sometimes it's not, I'm not able to, and it's, it's, for me, it's kind of like explaining what, like a water pressure, like a, like a dam, you know, you've got an empty sort of reservoir at the top and suddenly there's water coming up and the, the pressure on the dam is rising and it's not very strong dam. Uh, but you can kind of add some more logs to it. You can kind of sort of control it for a certain amount of time. The issue is once 
you let it all out, you know, you get home after this social event or something like that. The water pressure is so intense that it actually leads to more intense meltdowns than perhaps you would have had if you if you just didn't control it. Another thing that really stands out to me as a as a point is things around people. I have safe people. You know, with with a very vulnerable state you know, there's going to be a lot of anxiety. There's going to be a lot of sort of heightened awareness of our safety in a specific moment. And paranoia can become really, really intense, especially if you're in public um, with people you don't know, around people that you don't know, in a place that you haven't been to been before. Um, there can be a lot of paranoia, actually, even, even during, during the meltdown. And the thing is, is that when I'm with safe people. I feel like I can have a meltdown. I don't feel like I have to do the thing before, like adding logs to the dam to stop it from exploding, um, even though it eventually does. And so I, t I tend to have my meltdowns when I'm alone with my safe people, if I'm going to have one. You know, it probably, probably sounds a bit weird. It should be like the opposite way around, uh, but it isn't. It's, it's kind of like just being able to relax and being able to let things happen um, in safety and safe people allow me to do that when I'm not with a safe person, someone who I've perhaps had a meltdown around before and they've, you know, constantly pressured me for questions. They've made things really difficult for me. They've, I don't know, they've shouted at me. They've, they've made fun of me or, you know, anything like that in a public situation. Um, I'm going to hold it back and I'm, I'm going to do that temporary control and it's going to be a lot more intense um, once I'm actually in a place where I, f I feel safe. It's really weird because like I, c I can have such, you know, strong, strong aversions to people when I'm in those states because I can't really communicate well. And with, with all that anxiety and paranoia and my brain just going haywire and not being able to communicate, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a a, a state where if, if people do things wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to try and get away from them. <laughs> I'm going to push them away. And if I, if I'm really good friends with someone and I have a meltdown around them and they, they don't, they don't help or they do or they do the wrong things or I, it's actually going to, usually it, it carries on into normal life. You know, when I'm not having a meltdown, I'm like, I was in that vulnerable position and I didn't feel supported. I didn't feel like, you know, that I felt like they made it worse for me. I feel unsafe around them. And that's something that, that has occurred a few times in my life. Um, occasions like that, where I've had a good friend, um, perhaps they haven't been so understanding when I've had a meltdown and, um, I just really can't shake the, 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 the feelings of not being safe around them. Usually the people who are more likely to be my safe, safe people are calm, proactive, caring, uh, they listen, they, they take on board what I tell them. Those are usually the, the safe people, you know, the people that really don't put a lot of pressure on you and they don't get too stressed out and they, they just want to help and be there and they're, they're very proactive. So what about routine? Like, can we actually do anything? Well, in a meltdown, yes, we can. And those things tend to be things that we do all the time. Like in, in normal life, we do that. We do them all the time, like going on your phone and playing a mindless game. Or for me, you know, going on my phone and writing and ma making up scripts for a video or like making up um, different posts and, you know, things of that nature. Those things are things that I've done a lot. So I'm able to do that even if I'm having a meltdown, because usually they, they, they do a lot to kind of calm me down. And that's all because it's part of my routine. Things that are not part of my routine, I'm going to find excessively difficult. Just to give you a bit more of a, of a, of a list <laughs> to go off, these things can be for me, writing, mobile games, drinking, eating, going to the toilet, uh, even editing sometimes if, I'm, if I feel like I can do it. Um, anything that really kind of grabs my attention really tends to help me. So it's really good for me. So what happens when you're in a state of meltdown and you are really not, really not in a safe place and you're around some, some people who could actually cause you physical harm? What happens then? 
what do you do? You know, obviously with meltdowns, there comes a lot of, you know, a lowering of your, your ability to control your body, to to speak, to control your thoughts. So in the, in those situations, it can be like, oh, well, you must just roll over and must just um, let it, you know, let them beat you up or, you know, something like that. If my adrenaline peaks and I don't feel safe, I'm a lot more able to do things to make myself safer. Sure, I can sort of say, sort of talk, but it's going to be very, very broken. It's going to be very, very monotone. It's going to be very, very um, different to how I usually speak, but I can run away if I need to. I'd probably be a bit clumsy with it, but I can run away. I can protect myself. I could, well, probably all of these things, probably not as well as I could do in normal life, but I could do if I needed to. Now let's talk about the after. What happens after a meltdown? The dreaded meltdown hangover. Yes, post meltdown hangovers. <laughs> it's not just something that happens with alcohol or recreationals or anything like that. The, the intensity of the hangover depends on how intense and how long the meltdown was actually. This can be characterized by dropping general cognitive function, just generally being a bit slow, um, having low energy, so low energy levels, low social battery, uh, mental health and self-esteem can definitely take a big hit just by having a meltdown. But also, you know, if, you, if you're in a situation and you feel a bit like, oh, I've done something wrong or I feel embarrassed or, you know, anything like that, those can really play on your head um, either the time after the meltdown or the day after. And usually the best medicine for this this kind of situation is just to wait it out, just to just to eat and you know sleep and <laughs> drink water and just kind of get it just kind of get it out of your system. They're not fun, especially if you have you have a tendency to self injure, like hitting your head. It's probably going to make that feeling of hangover a little bit more intense. Um, it's happened to me on a few occasions, but in general, they, they tend to be quite consistent just for every everyday meltdowns, if you can call them that, <laughs> just your everyday meltdown, just go to the shops, have a meltdown, come home, have a sleep, go to work and blah de blah de blah One of the last things that I really want to talk about is hearing and remembering. You know, you, you, you try and help an autistic person who's having a meltdown or having a shutdown and you think, right? They're not communicating me. They look like they're, they're convulsing in some way. They they don't look like they can cope in this situation. They don't even look like they can function or listen or perceive anything. They just look like they're just gone. And the thing is that that's not the case. Although some people have told me that it's not the case of them, I definitely do hear and remember things when I'm having a meltdown. I hear people talking to me, I hear people saying stuff to each other about me <laughs> and I remember it. Sometimes it's a bit sort of hazy because uh, obviously it's a different state and there's so much anxiety and overload and lack of brain functionality, but I do remember it. You know, some people might be surprised to hear that. So that is my very last point. If you want to, to read the full article, the full article, uh, head over to my Instagram page, Thomas Hanley UK at Thomas Hanley UK. And if you want to check out my podcast where I think I've done an episode or two on, on meltdowns and shutdowns and things of that nature, uh, season one was in the top 5% and I've had some very notable guests on uh, both tailing the end of season one and also starting season two. People like Temple Grandin, people like Simon Baron Cohen, people like Steve Silberman, a lot of really influential people, but also advocates, real life advocates, um, particularly on Instagram. All of those links are down in the description. Likey subby, do all that kind of stuff, and I'll see you in another episode of Thomas Henley. <laughs> Still not used to the name change, but it's it's only been like a few days now, so yeah, it'll be fine. Be fine, good. I'll get my head sorted. I'll think of a good outro. <laughs> but in the meantime, take care. Love you guys. See you later.